Our scripture this morning comes from Matthew 26 and 27, a couple of selected verses, and uh, while it will be on your screen from the NIV version, I am going to be reading from Eugene Peterson's The Message. I hope I found the right verses. So from Matthew 26, verse 14 through 16, When one of the twelve, then one of the twelve, the one named Judas Iscariot, went to the Kabul of high priest and said, What will you give me if I hand him over to you? They settled on thirty pieces of silver. He began looking then for the, just the right moment to hand Jesus over. Then skipping over in Matthew 26 to verses 47 through 50, Jesus had just said that uh, his betrayer was there with them in the garden, in the Gethsemane. And just the words were barely out of his mouth when Judas, the one from the twelve, showed up. And with him a gang from the high priest and religious leaders, banishing swords and clubs. The betrayer had worked out a sign with them the one that I kiss, that is the one, sees him. He went straight to Jesus, greeted him. How are you, Rabbi? And he kissed him. And Jesus said, Friend, why this charade? And then they came to him, they grabbed him, they roughed him up, and they arrested him. Then go into chapter 27, verses 3 through 10. Judas, the one who had betrayed him, realized that Jesus was doomed, overcome with remorse, knowing that he had made a mistake. He gave back the 30 coins, silver coins, to the high priest and said, I've sinned, I've betrayed an innocent man. And they said, what do we care? That's your problem. Jesus, excuse me, Judas threw the silver coins into the temple and left. And he went out and hanged himself. The high priest picked up the silver pieces, but they didn't know what to do with them. Wouldn't be right to give this, which is a payment for murder, as an offering in the temple. So they decided to get rid of it by buying the potter's field and use it as a burial place for the homeless. And that's how the field was named Murder Meadow or Field of Blood, a name that is still stuck to this day. And then in the words from Jeremiah, it says, Jeremiah's words became history. They took the 30 silver pieces the price of the one priced by some sons of Israel, and they purchased the potter's field. And so they unwillingly, unwittingly followed the divine instructions in Je from Jeremiah to the letter. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Somebody just asked me in the fellowship hall, how are you doing today? Ask me at 12.30, and I'll tell you the truth, because then I will be great. We, we are a church that is blessed with lots of people coming to worship and Sunday school, so we got to get used to it, including me. I cannot imagine what it would have been like to talk to Judas. I don't know if you can even think about what, what would you have asked Judas? What would you have told Judas before he took the last breath on this earth? I would have said, Judas, God is in charge of forgiveness, not the rest of us. The rest of us is what we do, but God is in charge. I would have wanted Judas to know that what he did was wrong 
and it hurt our Lord? God forgives all of us, each one of us. And when we finally realize that when we ask God for forgiveness, no matter what we've done, we receive God's forgiveness and God's grace and we recognize God's love. By the time Judas ended his life, I suspect that he was so overpowered by evil and depression and spiritual illness that he could not see straight or think straight. Judas was not a bad person. He actually was a very religious person, but Judas chose to do bad things and selfish things, things that God did not want him to do and things that God did not tell him to do. Judas came from a very devout Jewish family and he was the only disciple that was from the south, Judea, Jerusalem. The other 11 were from Galilee, up north. So he was sort of an outsider with the rest of them his father's name was Simon, not to be confused with Simon Peter. The scholars believe that Judas was named for Judas Maccabeus, the great Jewish hero several generations before Jesus was born. His parents attended synagogue regularly and observed the law of Moses, and they taught their son, Judas, to do the same. But Judas chose to do bad things. Judas was selfish. Judas was pushy, and when things didn't go his way, well, he just pushed through like a bulldozer until things did go his way. We've all known a few people like that in our lifetime. Now people who do that, we recognize that they are never satisfied. No bully is ever happy. Judas, like many of us, expected someone to make him happy. He never got it. That happiness comes from inside of you as you give your life to God and respond to what God has given to you and to give away your own forgiveness and your own grace and your own love to others. That's what makes you happy. I don't think we even quite understand the whole story of Judas. He must have had a fairly good reputation because he was chosen to be the treasurer for the disciples. I mean, think about it. Here's Matthew who did treasury work his entire life for a living, but they didn't ask Matthew to be the treasurer. They asked Judas. They trusted him. Judas may have had expertise in financial matters, but we don't know that. So the disciples entrusted their funds to Judas, not Matthew. The Gospels do not indicate any criticism of the way Judas handled that responsibility. You see, none of the other apostles saw what was going on in Judas' heart and in his mind, but Jesus did. For Judas, Jesus just didn't move fast enough or harsh enough, and he didn't do things the way Judas would have done them. I don't think Judas intended that Jesus would die on the cross as a result of his failed scheme. I don't think Judas understood the result of his actions in turning Jesus over to his enemies. I think he thought there would be a huge miracle to happen. But also, I don't think we always intend what happens when we make bad choices or when we make selfish choices. And sometimes I think we understand the result of our actions and sometimes we don't. 
And in the mind of Judas, he was simply trying to force Jesus into doing what Judas wanted him to do. And at best, Judas wanted Jesus to become the national hero of the nation of Israel. Picture the image of a national hero driving Romans out of Jerusalem, riding in a chariot with six white horses. Don't you think that Judas was immediately unhappy with what he had done? It was clear to him that his scheme had not worked. His plan had not gone the way he thought it would. It didn't go the way he wanted it to. And he tried to make Jesus what he wanted Jesus to be. Have you ever known anybody like that? Do we need a show of hands? But it is not Jesus who can be changed by us, but we who must be changed by Jesus. Judas, like many of us, betrayed himself by his lack of patience, by his lack of understanding, by his lack of trust in Jesus and God and the disciples. He wanted Jesus to blast Rome and all of its evil. Judas wanted to make things happen immediately. As one scholar put it, Judas wanted to storm the Bastille instead of dumping the tea into the Boston Harbor. He didn't want to wait at all. He didn't want to wait at all. Does that sound familiar? Know anyone who is that impatient? Of course, none of us, but we know people that are outside, you know. After all, Judas had given the three best years of his life to Jesus. Could Jesus not do what Judas wanted? During those three years, Judas had been committed and loyal and faithful and loving, well, at least occasionally, once a year. And on top of this, he had been a faithful treasure for Jesus and those other 11 Galilean disciples who weren't doing what Judas thought they ought to anyway. Judas had done what he was supposed to do. Wasn't it time for Jesus to do something about those awful Romans? Judas was so tired of waiting. He had waited as long as he should, as long as he could, as long as he would. Another one of those shoulda, coulda, woulda people that we know outside of ourselves and family. He was pushed to the brink, pushed to the point of acting alone. Maybe Judas thought with just a little more push, Jesus would finally do something spectacular like the 4th of July in the New York Harbor. That's what Judas wanted to happen. Maybe Judas thought he could compel Jesus to produce miracles that would take care of Rome. Maybe Judas thought if he did something rash and brash, something that Jesus would do would be something that would make the world come to realize that Israel was the kingdom, the way it was supposed to be, the way Judas wanted it to be. So Judas sought to make Jesus into what he wanted Jesus to be. I think we've all seen that in every culture in the land. Maybe there's been a few times in your life when you thought you could push God into doing what you want God to do for you. Times when you thought you could tell God to do it this way or else. Do this or I'm leaving. Do you find yourself ever thinking like Judas and you don't even know it? And somebody might warn you, are you thinking like Judas? Oh, of course not. Really? You sound like Judas. Do you ever find yourself thinking 
like Judas that Jesus could perform any miracle in the world and all Jesus needs to do is check with you first? After all, Judas had seen Jesus perform the greatest miracles on earth. Judas had seen Jesus bring back life of persons who had once died. Judas had seen Jesus feed thousands of people, hungry people, with just a few loaves and a couple of fish. So surely Jesus could do anything he wanted, anything. Surely Jesus would not allow himself to be crucified on the cross when enemies were standing there and he had the power not only to avoid it, to put those enemies in their place. He could perform a miracle that would get rid of all those intolerable Romans. Jesus could establish the kingdom of Israel and save himself from death if Jesus just did these simple little things that Judas would have him do as the hero of the story. So even Judas would have been the hero of the story. If only God would do things the way I see it. If only God would check with me first. But that's not the way life is. Because that was the plan that Judas made, not God. So in plotting his strategy, Judas did not realize that Jesus could not be compelled to move away from his divine call. So instead of getting what he wanted, Judas caused Jesus to be turned over to the hands of his enemies who then would eventually crucify him on the cross. Judas was devastated by the failure of his plan. At this point, he returned the money, admitted his terrible deed, and never understood that God was in charge of forgiveness. Not one time did Judas ever understand that. Once again, Judas saw himself as the one in charge. One of the problems that Judas had but never faced was that he was a single issue disciple. That's not a good thing to be. The only thing that he was interested in was ridding the country of Romans and establishing Israel as the kingdom of God by his definition. It wasn't a bad issue, but the plan did not follow what God had in mind. So Jesus came to the revolution, but not the way Judas thought he would. And that's all Judas was concerned about. When we find ourselves playing God, when we think we know what God wants, or when we tell God what he wants, have we ever been guilty of that? Judas did not have the spiritual insight to see Jesus that had come to do more in this world than just to get rid of the Romans, more than just save Israel. Judas could not see that Jesus had come to save the last and the least and the lost, and that included the Romans. By the way, who are the Romans in your life? Who are the last and the least and the lost in your life? Who are the ones you have never been able to forgive because of what they did or what they said or what they didn't do? Judas never understood that Jesus offered life and life eternal to all, even though there was all these other issues that Judas couldn't deal with because he couldn't see the forest for the trees. 
Judas never quite understood that Jesus had come to proclaim the word of God that brought all of the people in as children of God. Do you think sometimes forgiveness was the only for people who actually deserved it? And you have the authority to determine who deserves it? No, Judas did not understand what was going on in the life of Jesus. He did not see that God would not force a miracle just because Judas, or you, or me, demanded it. Judas was his own worst enemy. And that is the ultimate worst thing that we can do. It's become our own worst enemy. Because Judas didn't trust God and he didn't trust Jesus and he did not trust the disciples, Judas had a problem. He no longer believed that God could make it happen. So he took matters into his own hands. And we know the rest of the story. So what can we learn from Judas? Are we too quick to judge? Are we too quick to tell others what they ought to be doing and how they ought to do it? Are we guilty of tunnel vision faith? We find one element and focus on it at the exclusion of all the others. There are some of us who center our lives on prayer and prayer is the single issue for our life. And that's all we talk about, that's all we read about, that's all we ever do. We forget that prayer is followed by serving others. Prayer is followed by action. Prayer is followed by mission and ministry. Sometimes we fall in the trap of focusing on salvation as our single issue. Then we neglect spiritual maturity, growing in our faith, bearing fruit in our lives and in the lives of others. How often do we get in a rut of tunnel vision faith? Judas teaches us God is God and we are not. We have been called to the church and to be the church and to be the church together, not separately. We don't tell people how to be the church. We are the church. When we feel ourselves condemning without mercy, even for Judas Iscariot or anyone else for that matter, let us remember what Jesus said, you who are without sin, among you cast the first stone. So today from this place, go with the blessings of God. Go with God's grace. Go with God's forgiveness so that you may forgive others. And today, forgive anyone in your life or in your family or in this church or in this community that needs forgiveness. Not because we deserve forgiveness but because we all need forgiveness. My name is Judas, and so is yours. Let us pray. Gracious God, you just move in and out of our lives, and we are so affected by your people, by your wisdom, by your proclamation by your word, and through your Son, our Savior. So give us this day as an opportunity to do for you and your kingdom what we need to do, what we need to say, and what we don't need to do. Because we pray together as your people. We pray together to receive the very gifts that you are giving us. Through Jesus our Christ, amen.
Let us stand and sing our closing hymn, number 389.